to God's house today as we draw to the conclusion of the Lenten season and prepare ourselves for Palm Sunday next weekend. As we begin today, we do so in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. I direct you to our call to worship that you uh, can follow along if you're following in the bulletin or just listen. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin. 
our own sins and the broken systems that bind us, we turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We fail in taking care of your good creation, instead exploiting it for selfish gain. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace. Through the power and promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, you are forgiven for the sake of Jesus Christ. In the wake of God's forgiveness, may we, the beloved community, living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. We join together at this time in professing our faith through the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Let's pray. Oh God, with steadfast love, you draw us to yourself. And in mercy, you receive our prayers. Strengthen us to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit, that through life and death we may live in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Gospel reading today is from John chapter 12, beginning in verse 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said an angel had spoken to them. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was going to die. This is our gospel reading. Well, for our sermon reading at this time, we have a prayer from Jonah chapter 2. We're obviously continuing in our sermon series, Prayers from the Old Testament. And today we are moving into a story that you think you know. So let's go ahead and hear this prayer from Jonah, this prayer that he prays from inside a fish. And then we'll, we'll get right down to the text. So from Jonah chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of of the fish, saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet you brought up my life from the pit. O oh Lord my God, as my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty, but... I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to the fish, and it spewed Jonah out upon dry land. Let's begin with prayer. God, as we spend time in this prayer of Jonah's, Lord, I, I ask that you equip me to or just expound upon this faithfully, or that you would use me to share your good news, share who you are, share what you're all about, and Lord, that you'd open the hearts of those that are hearing this right now, Lord, and that you would let it dwell in them richly. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
So I want to give you a name that you may or may not know. The name is Phil Vischer. And if you want to, if you want to pause this video right now and go look it up, go right ahead and let me know when you're back. I'll wait. All right, I'm assuming that if you haven't looked it up, you're waiting for me to tell you who Phil Vischer is. Maybe you know who it is, but Phil Vischer is the creator of really the soundtrack of my childhood, Veggie Tales. Well, I, I was a little old for it, but really my, my younger sister's childhood. If you were a parent or a grandparent in the mid 90s into the 2000s, you know the name Veggie Tales. And those cute Bible videos with vegetables, they populated Sunday schools and they were on VHS for kids to go home and watch while they waited for their parents to come home from work. It is, it is really the foundational texts for a whole generation of Christian kids. And Phil Vischer has some, some incredibly mixed emotions about VeggieTales. In fact, uh, in an interview in 2019, he expressed a lot of disappointment in VeggieTales. Uh, to quote him, he says in this interview, he said, it is, it is so much easier to teach morality. And that was his big takeaway, that with VeggieTales, he failed to bring the gospel into it as much as he'd like to and leaned in on a moral lesson. He said, and asked why that is, he said, it's so much easier to teach morality. It's so much easier to just tell a Bible story, pull a moral value out of it, and end with a Bible verse. There's value in that, but you never actually get to the message that leads to regeneration, that leads to new life, that leads to the fruit of the Spirit, and that's the core of the gospel. We haven't explained to kids how they're part of a bigger story. The gospel has been turned so often to just tips for a better marriage or tips to get through college without becoming an atheist. And yeah, I think Phil's right. If I remember anything about VeggieTales, it was the moral lessons at the end, but VeggieTales is not the source of that. We have a whole list, a whole library of Old Testament stories that I remember from Sunday school that were basically it. And the chief one of those is Jonah. Quite frankly, we, we know that story. And if you're asked, if I were to ask you right now, what is the central theme of Jonah or who is, what's the one thing you remember, you're going to say Jonah being swallowed by the fish. Well, my goal today, as we have this conversation, is to take that story of Jonah, look at this prayer, and help us rethink what the book of Jonah was all about, to rethink what the point of the entire book of Jonah was about. And I see in this prayer that Jonah prays from the belly of a fish, really the two key themes that we're supposed to take away from Jonah. And I promise you, neither one of them are just a moral lesson. So a little bit of background before we get to this prayer. In case all you remember about Jonah is him being swallowed by a big fish. A little bit of background, Jonah is a prophet. So he's God's mouthpiece. And he's given what seems like an impossibly dangerous task. And one that would make anyone in position shocked. He's told by God to go to the capital city, one of Israel's chief oppressors, Syria, and declare judgment. And we'll find out later why, but Jonah nopes out of there. He, he leaves, and instead of going to this capital city, Nineveh, he runs in the exact opposite direction. Nineveh is to the east, and he's trying to get to Tarshish, which is the furthest west you could go on the map. And he's so unwilling to go to Nineveh that according to the first chapter of Jonah, it says he's trying to flee the presence of the Lord. And from here, you, you probably know the story. Jonah ends up on a ship to Tarshish, uh, and a nasty once-in-a-lifetime storm hits the ship. The sailors end up throwing Jonah overboard at his request, and right as Jonah is about to drown, as he is drowning, a big fish is appointed by God to swallow him up, and Jonah is trapped in the belly of this fish for three days and for three nights. And that's where Jonah prays the prayer we just heard in chapter 2, a prayer of thankfulness, a prayer of praise and a response to deliverance. And what we see in this prayer is two incredibly important things. Truths about who God is and what God's plan is. We see in this prayer that God is present 
and at work in the worst, and that God is present and at work in our worst. That's really, that's really what Jonah's about. You probably thought Jonah was the central character of the story, but it's not. This, this narrative is about our God. So let's, let's look at that first point, that God is present and at work in the worst. Okay. In order to understand what I mean by that, I think we need to do a little bit of a looking back at some patterns that we see in Jonah. Again, this isn't the text you've heard, but there's really cool patterns that are showing up, leading up to this moment that Jonah's in the fish. First, when he realizes that he has to go to Nineveh, he leaves, and he goes down to Joppa, and then he goes down to the boat, and then Jonah goes down to the inner part of the ship, and then he goes down into sleep, and when the storm hits, he is thrown overboard, and according to the prayer, he goes down into the heart of the sea, down to the roots of the mountains, and finally, down to the land where bars closed upon me forever. In other words, he's at the gates of death. This pattern is showing that, that Jonah was so desperate to flee from the presence of God that he keeps moving further and further away from him. He is trying everything he can do to get further. He goes down to the ship. He goes down to the boat. He goes down into sleep. He goes down to the ocean. And every step he takes as he tries to flee the presence of God is in fact showing us that he's getting further and further away from the presence of God. In fact, in verse 4, in that prayer he says, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? Jonah has found himself exactly where he wants to be away from the presence of God, or so he thinks. He finds himself at the gates of death, and he realizes that he no longer is, in his mind, in the presence of God. But that's not exactly the case, right? Because in this moment, when he thinks he's the furthest away, when he thinks he's trapped at the very bottom, God sends him deliverance. And not deliverance in a way <laughs> that we would expect God sends a fish to swallow him up. In fact, this prayer is not him praying to be delivered from the fish, but that he is praying about his deliverance while in the belly of the fish. It says in verse 2 that he prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying that God has answered my prayer. He sees God in this moment as delivering him even though he is still trapped in the belly of a fish at the bottom of the sea. And he's on this three-day, three-night journey, which if you ever want to see a cool pattern, check out through the scriptures. Three days and three nights is always like a journey to hell and back. He's been at the gates of death, and God has delivered him through what to us looks like a punishment. And then finally, spits him up on dry land. Or if you look at another translation, uh, probably a little... A little closer translation, he vomits him on dry land. He has a deliverance in the midst of the worst he can imagine. Even though he thinks he's no longer in the presence of God, God reaches out in the worst and delivers him in a way that he could not have possibly imagined, in a way that seems awful as you read it. And I can't help but think about the Good Friday that's coming up. I can't help but think about Easter that's on the way, and quite frankly, I can't think, help but think about the Saturday in which Jesus laid in the tomb. Because we also see God at work in the worst for us. We see God reveal his redemption plan, his rescue plan to save his people through Jesus' death on the cross. We see God reach into a place where we say, where is God present in this? In fact, Jesus' last words are, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet there is God working in the worst of it, bringing redemption, bringing salvation through Jesus' death on the cross, through his, his rest in the tomb, and then ultimately through his resurrection. But what we realize is his deliverance begins before that and takes place right there at the cross. Which is fine. That's beautiful. We can end it there. But this, this poem reveals something else. This prayer reveals that not only is God at work in the worst, that he's at work 
at our worst. I think one of the reasons that VeggieTales ends up as sort of this backbone of Sunday school curriculums for so long is because we love a good morality tale, right? I remember as a little kid raising my hand and saying, what's the moral of Jonah? And it could be any number of things. Jonah's about how we need to be obedient, right? Jonah's about having to do what, be able to do what you're told. Jonah's about how you shouldn't run away from God or your responsibilities. Maybe Jonah's about how you should be compassionate or how you're supposed to forgive people even when you don't like them, even when they're jerks. In fact, I'm pretty sure the VeggieTales movie about Jonah ends with that. Forgive people even when they're jerks. But that's not what Jonah is about. It's not a morality tale. And in fact, I think the fact that we're so drawn to the morality tale points out to what Jonah has to reveal to us anyway. Jonah is in the middle of unrepentance. Jonah is absolutely not changed his position on going to Nineveh. In fact, Jonah, if we were to sort of use a scriptural imaginarium, Jonah is not exactly sad about having to die. And you see that he's unrepentant towards the end of his prayer where he says, those who worship vain idols forsake their hope and steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. He's saying he's going to go to the temple. He's going to perform his prophet duties, but he doesn't confess and he doesn't repent. But God still delivers him. In the midst of Jonah's worst, an unrepentant drowning, God sends a fish to rescue him and then to get him back on the track. And you'd think, man, that should be enough, right? But no, because later on we find out why Jonah's running in the first place. He gets to Nineveh, does the bare minimum of what his job expects, and then when he realizes that God is forgiving the Ninevites, he responds this way. He says, later on, he says, Oh, Lord, is this not what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. How could you save those people, God? They're the worst. How could you extend grace and mercy to them? They don't deserve it, and I knew that you would, and that's why I ran, because I knew that you were a God that saves people at their worst, and they, they don't deserve it. Now I can't tell you how many times I've heard the same arguments in the church. I've been involved behind the scenes in some sort of a ministry capacity since I was like 15 years old. Some of you have heard this story. I remember when we looked at doing outreach ministry in my small town of LaBelle to the local immigrant community, and someone stood up and said, I know they have to worship somewhere but why does it have to be here? I can tell you that I've heard people come in and say, hey, I know the church is supposed to be for those people, but do we really have to be? I know it's supposed to be a community church, but does it have to be that community? I remember when Amigos and Crystal worshiped here, and it's amazing how they had their own service, which is an amazing thing, but even at that time, I remember folks saying, do they have to be here? Do they deserve grace and mercy? We do it all the time. We have our neighbors that we say, man, if only they would clean up their acts, I would invite them to church. I remember my younger sister being driven from the church. And they told her her friends didn't look like kids that belonged. We love to pick and choose who God delivers. And we love to think that somehow we deserve it when they don't. But Jonah, in that last line of the prayer, he says, deliverance belongs to the Lord. And that includes for us. Paul says later in the letter in the Romans, sort of our foundational Lutheran text, Paul says, who's going to bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. It's God who picks, not us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. It says, God proves his love for us, you, me, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
It says later, for while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through death of his son. We didn't reconcile to God and then become non-enemies. God reconciled you while you were unable to save yourself, while you were still unrepentant. God sent Jesus Christ to die for your sins so that while having died with him in our baptisms, we much more surely will have been reconciled and saved by his life. God is at work in the present in our worst, just like he is for Jonah. Now the funny thing is Jonah, it's never clear at the end of Jonah whether he actually is repentant and, and fully understands what God has done, but we see it in it through Jesus Christ. We know what God has done. We know that while we couldn't save ourselves, while we were trying to determine who belongs and who doesn't, God reached in to our lives for Jesus Christ and brought us into reconciliation when we didn't deserve it. The theme of Jonah is that God is at work when we can't feel his presence in the worst. He's at work at our worst to bring about his rescue plan for his creation. God loves his creation so much that he'll meet us in the worst circumstances to bring about reconciliation. In fact, he will at times bring us into the worst circumstances to see the work of the good news in our lives. We also see that God is unwilling to leave anyone behind in declaring good news and forgiveness of sins, even for those that we don't think deserve it. What we see in Jonah is that God's gracious and merciful, that he is slowed anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent even for you and for me. And he demonstrates this love for you and I through the death of his son, Jesus Christ, in which he takes our worst, buries it in the tomb, that we might be delivered into new life. My prayer for you as you hear this is that you see what God is doing in your life today that you, you cling to the good news that even when you don't deserve it, Jesus Christ died for your sins, so that way you may be reconciled to God and that, that we are able to take that good news out to our friends, our families, and let it just dwell richly in our lives so we may proclaim it to each other. Let's pray. God, in your grace and your mercy, while we were at our worst, rebelling and resisting against you while we were in the worst, dead in our sins. You brought Jesus Christ into our lives to die for us, to bring us into new life through his resurrection. You seal us as your own, even though we don't deserve it. And you call us yours. Lord, let our lives be ones that are marked and sealed by that good news. Or strengthen our faith that it can cling to that good news so that we may proclaim your goodness wherever we go and live in that freedom. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. Gracious God, you make us clean through baptism and remember our sin no more. Make your church a community of forgiveness throughout the world. Give your people courage to forgive. Bless the ministry of repentance and reconciliation. You promise to write your law in our hearts, gracious God. Guide citizens throughout the world to shape communities that reflect your mercy, justice, and peace, and give them creativity to work for the welfare of all. Merciful God, you sustain us with your spirit. Restore the joy of all who need to know your presence, especially those who are lonely or who need to experience your grace anew, those who need healing of mind or body, those who are dying, and all who grieve. Lord, we especially lift up these individuals today. We pray prayers of concern for Joe Goffner. We pray for healing for Bob Rieske Jr., who has cancer. We lift up Pastor Mark Gartner as he recovers from surgery. We pray for a successful procedure on Don Almond's back, that he may have relief from back pain and neuropathy. We lift up Pete and Katie who are expecting twins and we pray that you would make the delivery uneventful and joyful. We continue to pray for Ron and healing as he recovers from eye surgery. Today, Lord, too, we continue to pray for Glenn Losey as he recovers from a fall. We lift up Jack and we ask for uh, relief from pain for Jack. We lift up Gordon Reese and we pray that his transition home will will be a good one, Lord, and his recovery will continue. We lift up Chuck as he recovers from a torn Achilles tendon. Gracious God, we lift up Anne, the parish nurse at St. Michael's, as she has a bone marrow transplant uh, uh, that has happened a, uh, a few days ago, and we pray that it has gone well. We lift up Donna Shirley, and we pray for relief from back pain. And we pray for Elizabeth and ask for healing from mental health issues. The gracious Lord, we continue to pray for all who are impacted as well by COVID-19, and in particular, those who grieve the loss of family members. Lord, today we remember the family of Jim Rieske who died from COVID. We pray that you'd bless and comfort them with the knowledge of eternal life through Jesus. We pray for Lee's family too, as they mourn the loss of Lee who died from COVID. And we pray for the family of Leo White, who's called to be with you. Lord, especially bless and comfort his brother, Curtis. Lord, today we also pray for your mission. We ask that you would help us to find ways to share your love. We lift up our uh, brother in Christ Jesus, Pastor Carl Glander, as he serves at Bethlehem Lutheran Church in Immokalee. Um, and Lord, we pray for Chelsea Irwin, who serves as a missionary in the Czech Republic. Lord, bless Chelsea as she works in your name. In the cross of Christ, your name is glorified. We praise you for those who have given us words to worship you. With all those who have died in Christ, bring us into life everlasting. We entrust ourselves and your prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit strengthen and keep you as you go in the peace of our Savior. Depart in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Jesus, blessed Lord, to Thee. My heart felt thanks forever be, who has so lovingly bestowed on me thy body and thy blood. Break forth my soul for joy to say, what wealth is come to Blessed 